Oh, hey, I didn't see it there. Actually, yeah, I did. I had to set up the camera, put the lights up, and hit record. I don't know why people try to be spontaneous on YouTube videos. We know we hit record, but it's a cold winter day. It's raining outside, I've got my snuggly clothes on, and I've been catching up on YouTube comments. And as I go through them, I noticed a lot of you really enjoyed my last three minute Majestic Mountain painting video. In fact, one of you already painted it within just a couple of hours after that painting video went live. So good job, awesome for you. So I kind of figured, hey, why not do a little step-by-step -step commentary to give you tips and tricks on how to conquer that painting. Because when you watch a time-lapse, you know, it, you, don't, you don't get everything. And I want you to build confidence and, you know, dominate any tutorial that I show you. So I'm gonna sit here, I got my coffee ready to roll, gonna go through the video and give you some tidbits on how to make that painting so that way you can conquer it too. But first, let, let me show you outside. I live here in California and trust me, it like never rains here, it's a rarity. Let me show you. Oh, there's one of my artworks, but look at this. Look, it's just beautiful little rain. Look at the cloudy days that we get. You guys don't realize how rare this is. Look, little birdie. Alrighty, let's go back inside. When starting off with this painting, obviously you need to put down your liquid white base coat. Then you put your two bands of color at the top of the canvas and the bottom of the canvas. You only need a little bit here because we're gonna be pulling the gradient towards the center of the canvas. So don't be afraid to do some crisscross strokes and pull really hard, but make sure you start to feather that crisscross stroke as you get to the center of the canvas because we wanna leave that nice gap of white which is gonna help us here in just a moment. Okay, so many of you aren't used to using an angle shader, but if you struggle making mountains with a palette knife, an angle shader is a must have brush in your toolbox. The reason is because that brush has like a 45 degree cut on the bristles, so it makes it easy to chisel an outside edge of your mountains. If you're right-handed or left-handed, all you have to do is just flip the brush in the direction that you wanna go, that you're fading your mountain down, and it's super simple. All you need to do is just shake your hand a little bit. Now you're probably wondering, how did I decide where to put my mounds or how big to make them? Honestly, for a speed painting tutorial, I don't really think about that. What I think about is where my light source kind of is coming from, and I want my valley point to meet there. Everything else is kind of, you know, a second thought. I wanna have two peaks. I wanna have one higher than the other so it looks more natural, but I wanna fade the valley to the center that you can see here. The outside edges, I don't really care. I'm gonna fade them off, and so that way they're not distracting my focal point. My focal point should be right where that white is because that's my brightest spot in my painting. Hence, it's my light source. Another reason why the angle shader is such a powerful brush for mountains is it makes it easy to pull down and shape your mountain because it's gonna fade naturally with that liquid white down there. Now you can leave some dark spots like you see at the top of my mountain here because you know what it looks like? It looks like light didn't make it past that little peak spot, so there's a natural shadow, which is what we're gonna do constantly throughout this painting. We're going to introduce light colors with white and sometimes a nice desaturated purple mixed with white, and then we're gonna introduce darker colors by introducing more Prussian blue. And I'm just gonna fade those back and forth as I pull my mount towards that center where the light can play off that light source in the background there. Now, when it comes to deciding what will be a highlight side and what will be a shadow side, you wanna know my honest answer again for when it comes to speed paintings? I don't really think about it. I kind of play with the brush a little bit that you can see right here where I just go back and forth. And then, you know, I step back for my painting and I let my brain kind of fill in where I can kind of see lights play off shadows. Maybe there's a small peak, maybe there's a small crevasse, maybe there's just like a gash or a break or something that happens within that plane of that mountain that creates light. It's hard for me to visualize on the fly sometimes, so I like to scratch some things in and see where I can take it from there. And that's all I did within this painting. Once I've scratched in a couple of marks here, it makes it very easy to see where light hits the highlight side and where shadow falls on to the shadow side. I know, redundant way of saying it, but you know what I mean. So I want to accentuate that. Now you can play with the highlights first or you can play with the shadows first. I like to flip flop just to make uh, some things easier for me, but you do what you like. I started with the furthest source from the light source, which would be my shadow side on the left side, which is just me pulling the shadow color down with more Prussian blue. And I leave it kind of streaky because it looks like light scatters and bounces off particular parts of my painting, or sorry, my mountain, giving it more shape. 
but everything that's facing towards that light source is gonna be a little bit more of a highlight side. So again, we're gonna just introduce a little bit of titanium white, so that way it creates a contrast shaping my mountain, making it look like it has characteristics and dimension to it. The nice thing about when you do these type of mountains with an angled shader is the fact that you can play around and make mistakes. If you wanna make something lighter, hey, just work it off with that angle shader and introduce a lighter tone. If you wanna introduce something dark because you wanna introduce a new shadow, just dab in slightly to a darker color. For me, it's Prussian blue in this painting and just slightly streak it in a little bit more. Work it in even harder and it's gonna fade naturally and again, create those characteristics in the mount. The whole point is, play around with the light. This is gonna give you building blocks to get you more confident. So when you do something on a bigger scale, it's gonna be easier because you understand all of the key assets that have to go into it. You wanna know something that I messed up on this painting that you probably didn't notice, is as I got to the base of my mountain, I should have faded it out more by rubbing off some color with like a, a shop towel. So that way there's more white at the bottom because that would create more of a contrast for when I put in my tree line. There'd be just this beautiful white glow between where my tree peaks are and the mountain, creating more of a separation, which I would recommend doing for you. But you know what? I actually forgot to do that. It doesn't affect the painting, but it'll make your painting stand out more. Now, when it comes to a tree line, you know what I do? I loaded up my brush with a really dark color with a fan brush, and I literally just chop down at like a 45 to 60 degree angle where I go, where I go, I'll do it from the side, where I go in and pull, in and pull. So that way I get a strong peak from the top of my fan brush, which looks like the tree peak sticking up. And then I will have the brush when it pushes in, it blooms out a little bit, giving me a fatter base. And I just do that really quickly from left to right, right to left. But the thing you wanna to remember to do that can be difficult is don't make them all even as you go across. Cause then you're gonna have something like a picket fence. Nature is not even, it's not symmetrical in every aspect that it is. So make some trees higher and lower, put some gaps in there. And that way you'll have something that looks a little more natural. Another step that I didn't really show in the video is after I push in my trees, I went back and I took just the tiniest bit of white with a little bit of purple in it. And at the base, I just kind of like pushed in a little color and flicked up. And what that does is it looks like the tree base or the tree trunks looks like there's a little bit of light cascading through. It's hard to see on the video, but trust me, you'll see it with your eye when you do it in your painting. Since we're creating our tree line on a reflection base, we need to make sure that we have something reflecting up. So basically just flip your brush over if you need to, if that makes you feel more comfortable, and just put a basic amount of lines and dashes that represent the trees that are on the mid ground there. You don't have to be heavy handed here. You only need a little bit of paint to make a reflection, okay? Once you have that, I like to clean my brush off a little bit or at least pull out the residual color and go back to where my trees are in my mid ground and very, very gingerly pull up and flick up with just a couple of hairs. In my mind, most trees grow up towards sunlight, so I want them kind of pulling up. And this is actually gonna help fade the trees just ever so slightly. Remember, these are, these are mid-ground to very kind of background trees here, so they shouldn't have a lot of detail, which is why I give that little extra flick. Plus, it's actually gonna pull that white base color up a little bit more, creating some separation between the trees every now and then. Next up, we have making the trees reflections in the water. And this is actually really simple. Just take a two inch brush and go straight at it and push to where the bristles bend and pull down. But as you pull, you wanna pull pressure away so that we don't pull all of that uh, darker green color all the way down to the base because then you're going to you're going to lose that beautiful purple. So put a lot of pressure and then as you start to flick and pull down, really pull away from the canvas so you get that nice beautiful feather effect. Now here's a tip that a lot of you don't see. When you make YouTube tutorial videos, you don't realize how far off to the side I am standing so that way I'm not blocking the camera. So a lot of times my lines will be skewed from left to right or right to left or be wonky just because I can't fully see it. What I want you to do that really helps me out is stand about, stand about two feet away from your canvas and stand right in front of it. It'll give you an easier perspective as you go across. Then once you've created your horizon line there of your water reflection, stand back like an extra four feet or six feet. So that way you can actually 
take in the full perspective of how the line goes across. If it's wonky one way or the other, just slightly feather in and pull down again. Just needs a little bit of pressure to correct that line. But a lot of people don't get that when they're painting. They'll stand really close to their painting and before you know it, your line's going wonk or wonk like that. I do it all the time, but that's because I'm painting like this a lot of the time. So just stand, you know, two feet, then four feet, and then six feet, and then see how things change on the perspective, okay? When you want to make your trees look like they're ripples within water of that lake there, you just take your two inch brush and go left to right or right to left in segments. So that way the water looks like it's wavy as the trees come down. Now, to be honest, this is just something you can do for fun if you want to have it, or maybe your water's still and you just want to pull it straight down. It's more of an artist choice. If I could have done this again, I like the wavy effect, but I wish I didn't put as much pressure because you can see in the bottom right hand corner, I lost the effect of the purple cutting through the trees. And now it's just like a very dark green. Still looks beautiful, but I wish I would have kept it a little bit more like the left. So, you know, live and learn. Always start with light pressure because you can always add more. I messed up and I put too much pressure at the beginning. Now, when you want to make water look like it's happening within your lake, which I love to do, I always love to go with a palette knife and either load the top end or the bottom end. Both have different effects, and I did a video on that that you can watch in the top right corner here that shows you how to create water lines and how putting paints on the top of the knife or paints on the bottom knife has different effects. So I'm not gonna go over that, but what I do want you to do is make sure your lines are even across. Again, go back to the tip we just said about standing in certain segments across from it, but one thing that's really gonna help your painting look like it has motion in the water or wind is cascading across it and creating little white caps or pushing water in certain segments is take your knife, scratch and pull, literally pull against your canvas. It will expose the bottom of your canvas, but don't worry about that. We're going to fix that in a second, but just drag and pull and the paint will, will start to leak out from left and right of your palette knife, looking like these beautiful, beautiful little white cap ripples that happen in your water. And it's such an easy effect. Don't be afraid to scratch really far left and really far right. Just try your best to keep the water even or your, your knife even so it creates these beautiful effects. If you do left and right with your palette knife, it's gonna look really wonky and it doesn't really match the natural look that your landscape's trying to achieve. So at the very end of our painting here, I use a fan brush and a lot of people don't understand what I'm doing here. Now, the water lines near the base of my trees are way, way far back. So they need to have less detail. With that fan brush, I find it easier just to fade in and out the water line so it gets pushed into the canvas more and blends with that base coat, making it more dull. Hence, it's going to fade in the background there. Now, the parts where we took our knife and we dragged really hard to make those beautiful ripples that have more uh, texture to them, it will at times expose the canvas underneath. So again, with a clean fan brush, I like to go behind the ripple anywhere and just slightly pull and fade in straight lines, in straight lines, into my water, which would be that purple and green color there. So that way it fixes the line, but it also does one extra thing. It adds a pull streak across that white cap there. So it looks like the white cap has a little bit of motion, like it actually formed up into a wave created a little bit of a crush and then purled a little bit. And it creates these beautiful, beautiful streaks. It also kind of makes the water look a little bit icy if the colors you used in your painting are colder. It looks like maybe a little bit of frost or low hanging fog hit there, which is a cool little effect a lot of people don't do. But as you get closer to the foreground of your canvas, you want to be a little bit softer because you want to hold that texture. Remember, as things get closer to us, it should have more detail. And I like to use more detail as sometimes more texture, which is why you see at the base of the painting, I have those really, really thick water lines and it makes the rest of the painting get pushed back even more. To be honest, I think this is one of my better quick tutorial paintings out there. You know why? Because I do think it's actually simple and rewarding. You see a beautiful landscape that you create from just a few basic strokes. And I know you can do this. And I hope this video right here really kind of um, took away some of the things that uh, may scare you away from doing it because now we broke it down and you see how simple it can be. It really is one of the most simplest paintings out there. 
give it a shot. And if you do, hey, I'd love to see what you created. You can also do me a huge favor, go down below, hit like, subscribe, and leave me a comment. While you're down there, leave me a comment. Let me know what you'd like the next quick tutorial to be. I'm always on the lookout for ideas of what the community would love. And if you wanna be a part of this community, you can do me a huge favor. I would love for you to join and become a YouTube channel member for as little as $1 a month. Yeah, $1. You can help support me on my creative journey, which then makes me pump out more content to help support you. Also down right below this video player. I hope you enjoyed this style of video because I want to demystify a lot of things that you sometimes don't get in a quick time-lapse video. I'm going to get back to those YouTube comments because I love responding to all of you. But until next time, my friends, take care. And of course, peace.